Peace and blessings, YouTube. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Bible Class Truth Hour here on the four-time National Award winning POET Radio. I'm your host, your brother, your minister, Brother Black Ice, DeAndre Hawthorne of the Truth Hour Bible Class. And tonight's Bible Class, we are dealing with, brothers and sisters, the process, understanding the process of death, from death to eternal life. Understanding the process from death to eternal life. Now, again, this particular lesson tonight is um, in honor of Carl V. Hawthorne, who was the matriarch of my family, 96 years old. And he was the first one that told me, he said, um, you're going to be a preacher. You're going to be a minister. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not with all of that. And here it is today. I'm an ordained licensed minister today. And I've been um, preaching and teaching the word of God for over 12 years now on this network, on this platform, in this program, the Truth Bible Bible Class. But tonight's lesson, we're going to teach on understanding the process from death to eternal life. Now, when we read the word of God, brothers and sisters, we understand that death is was not an original part of God's creation. Death did not enter into God's creation until man was found to be disobedience in the garden. Remember when he said that you can eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So God gave us a choice and he always gives us a choice. And unfortunately, our father, Adam, chose death. So through that sin, brothers and sisters, death entered into God's creation. Before that, there was no death. And even after that, man covered themselves with fig leaves. Remember that? Because he knew that he could not kill an animal to get fur to cover his private part. Because it was a law. And he was bound by the law, so he did not want to break the law, although he had already broken the commandment. And so God came back and he said, I'm going to cover you with skin. Where did God get the skin from? He got the skin from an animal. So the first animal sacrifice to cover sin was done in the garden when God made Adam and Eve coats of skin to cover themselves. Because, see, when sin is committed, blood has to be shed and something has to die. And thus, we've gotten to where we are now. And so, Carl V. Hawthorne, the eldest in my family, 96 years old. And I just preached the funeral yesterday. Mama Shirley Lewis, which was my childhood um, friend's brother, Tarani, his mom passed away and he said, um, Tony, which is what my family calls me, Tony, he said, I want you to preach my mother's funeral. I don't want nobody saying that my mother's up in heaven, looking down, smiling. I want you to preach this funeral based, my mother's funeral based on what the word of God says. And that's what this lesson tonight is going to be about, what the word of God says. So in order for you to know what the word of God says, guess what? We got to go into the book. And we got to read what the word of God says. So if you have your Bible, then please follow this lesson with us tonight. We're going to start this thing off in the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, right? There's a season for everything under the sun. A season for everything under the sun. And again, when I was in Mexico, I got the text that my loved one had passed away. So let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. Book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. And we're going to read verses 1 through 4. And it reads, To every thing there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time 
to dance. And so we understand, brothers and sisters, that when we deal with this life that we live today, there are going to be times when we are happy and we are joyful and we're greeting one another with hugs and kisses. And there are going to be times when we're crying and when we're mourning. And even in this word of God, the shortest verse in the Bible says Jesus wept. What did he weep for? He wept over the passing of Lazarus, whom he eventually resurrected, brothers and sisters. But again, even after he was resurrected, eventually Lazarus had to go back to sleep and be put back in the grave and back in the ground because the resurrection has not happened yet. A resurrection has happened before, but not the resurrection. The one that you get up and you never lay back down for. So let's go ahead and continue reading our lesson. Now, we are referred to as sheep in the Bible, brothers and sisters. Right? That's what we're referred to. We refer to as sheep in the Bible. But I want you to know that sheep have a shepherd. And our shepherd is none other than Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And he in the Bible is called the good shepherd. So let's read a little bit about the good shepherd and get some understanding of how he comforts us. Because remember when he said, when I go, I'm going to leave you a comforter. And we had no idea when we were young in the spirit and immature in the spirit of what that comforter was. But now we know that that comforter, brothers and sisters, is even the angel and the word that the angel delivers to us. So let's read what the word says in the book of Psalms 23, 1 through 6. Psalms 23, 1 through 6. Isn't this something how the angel embodies the word of God? The angel delivers the word of God to man. The Bible calls the angel a ministering spirit. And if he's in heaven with the Father and the Son, then he's holy. Then he is the Holy Spirit who delivers the word to man. So we're going to go to the book of Psalms, the 23rd chapter, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Psalms 23, 1 through 6. Tonight's lesson is entitled, Understanding the Process from Death. To eternal life. Psalms 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, how do we get to dwell in the house of the Lord, brothers and sisters? And what is the house of the Lord? Well, Jesus spoke in the Lord's Prayer when he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That kingdom is the Lord's house. And the only way you access it is when it's brought from up there to down here. And that's why he said, thy kingdom come. And so here it's prophesied that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are working now, brothers and sisters, to gain access to that house when it comes so that we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But there are some things that we have to get right before we get to that point. And again, brothers and sisters, Carl V. Hawthorne lived 96 years on this earth. And... I never knew life without his existence. And I would see him preach and I would see him minister. And he preached my son's funeral and my father's funeral and, and uh, 
my my uncle's funeral and my cousin's funeral and I would always look at them and and I would always see them and you know of course you know some of the old time preachers they got their way of preaching and ministering and doing their thing <clears throat> and then when I began to mature in the word of God and mature in the spirit we would have these talks and we have we would have these conversations and he wouldn't tell me I was wrong or he wouldn't even disagree with me right because of course more knowledge and information is available to us today than it was for them back then he would just tell me you preach the word of God Tony as it was given to you and I always respected him for that. Although he was a Sunday preacher and a Sunday minister, he didn't take issue with those of us who kept the Sabbath day and those of us who looked at the statutes, laws, and commandments that were in the book and taught those things and deviated from the traditional teachings of celebrating Christmas, the pagan holiday, or celebrating Easter, the pagan holiday, and the things that our ancestors did. But what he did say is that you just teach the word of God the way it was given to you. And that was our way of, on some issues, just agreeing to disagree. Everybody is given a path, and everybody is given... A mission. My mission may not be yours and yours may not be mine, but everyone who enters into this service has a job to do. Brothers and sisters, even in death, there is hope in Jesus. And that's what this lesson is about today. That's what he came to do, brothers and sisters, die for the remission of sins for men. Nothing that this world does can separate us from Jesus, even death. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to say that again. Nothing in this world can separate us from Jesus. Many of us do things willfully, brothers and sisters, with understanding, but it's not too late for us to reverse this thing and turn this thing around. And let me make a correction when I say nothing can separate us. No external forces can separate us from Jesus, but we can separate ourselves from him. Let's go to the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, 35 through 39. Romans, the 8th chapter, 35 through 39. And it reads, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation do it or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels and that includes the fallen ones, brothers and sisters. Nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor in any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's a powerful, powerful statement, brothers and sisters. And it's beautiful to know that this is written because once it's written, it can't be changed. And so, brothers and sisters, many who don't know and understand the word of God may ask, why does God allow these things to happen? Why did my mother die? Why did my grandfather die? Why did my uncle, my cousin, my son die? Sometimes we have no understanding. And we look at people, they are very good people. And you say, man, why is it that all the good people have to suffer and go through these things? Good people have to suffer the tragedies that they've suffered in this world and on this earth. Let's get some understanding for that too. Let's go to Isaiah 57. And we're going to read two verses. One and two. Isaiah 57. Verses one and two. Good people, brothers and sisters, 
are taken away from this earth, but sometimes God does it with the purpose behind it. I wonder why my father, my grandfather, my uncle, and all of them had to go. My son, why did he have to go? Why did he have to pass away? And the Bible gives us understanding of some of the reasons why these things happen outside of Adam committing sin and death being passed to his creation. But sometimes we wonder, why him? Why her? Why so young? Well, let's read what Isaiah 57, 1 and 2 says. It says, the righteous die. Did you hear what I said? Not only bad people, it says the righteous die, perish. And no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away. None understanding that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. The righteous, brothers and sisters, sometimes God would remove them so that they won't have to deal with the things that are shortly coming to pass. But we who are here still in the living, <clears throat> we are the ones that still have to go through the suffering. And the things that we see every day on social media, the lives of so many people being taken in evil and sadistic ways. And it ain't going to get better, brothers and sisters. It's going to get worse. And so we got to understand the process from death to eternal life. Now, man only lives to be a short or, or, or only lives a short time or a short period of time on this earth. Right. Carl V. Hawthorne lived to be in his 90s. But according to God, that still ain't no time, brothers and sisters. We got to put this thing in perspective. Let's find out what 100 years is to God, let alone 90s and in, 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 in the 90s. Let's just use the 100. Sometimes rounding off to the nearest tenth is an easy number to calculate. So let's find out if somebody lived to be 100, 100 years old. How much time that is in God's time. Let's go to 2 Peter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. And it reads, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. So let's look at this thing in perspective. If a thousand years is one day, and one day is 24 hours, correct? What's 10% of a thousand? 10% of a thousand is 100. So even if my loved one, Carl V. Hawthorne, minister, pastor lived to be a hundred years old although he got close he was in his mid 90s but let's just say he was able to live to see a hundred years old let's put this thing in perspective if a hundred is ten percent of a thousand and a thousand is one day to the lord and one day as you know is 24 hours what's ten percent of 24 hours It's only two hours and 40 minutes, brothers and sisters. So even if we're blessed to live to see 100 years old, according to God's time, that's nothing but two hours and 40 minutes. So it just goes to show you, brothers and sisters, we think that we're doing something. I'm 60 years old. I'm 70 years old. I'm 80 years old. I'm 90 years old. Oh, they're 100 years old. It means a lot to us, but to God, hundred years ain't nothing but two hours and 40 minutes. Now, we need to realize, brothers and sisters, or accept that time is not on our side. And so that tells us not to waste time, brothers and sisters. We ain't got time to worry about what people are doing. We ain't got time to worry about what people are saying about us. We ain't got time to worry about what people are thinking about us. You know how we get 
Oh, this person said this about me or this person said that about did you see what this per you're wasting your time and we don't have time to waste. Let's read the book of Job, the 14th chapter. Job, the 14th chapter. And we're going to go through a few of these verses in the book of Job, the 14th chapter. And let's find out what time is like according to God. We're going to read um, Job. The 14th chapter, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Job 14, verses 1 and 2. You can read the whole chapter on your own. It says, man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. So since we've been born and we've gotten out from under the nest egg of our parents, didn't mean that you were out of their home, but you were able to start doing things for yourself. We started getting in trouble, got pregnant at an early age, got in trouble, got kicked out of school, got in trouble, got disciplined for doing this or doing that, got in trouble. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. You know how it is when one moment a shadow is behind you and the next minute. The shadow is gone. And so, brothers and sisters, this goes to tell us that we truly don't have time to waste. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastics, the ninth chapter. Now, when we speak about the process of death leading to eternal life, we got to speak and tell the truth. And I go to many services. And again, I just taught one and spoke at one and ministered one yesterday. But one thing that you did not hear me say was that your loved one was looking at you smiling. That's not biblical, brothers and sisters. And that's the difference between a biblical Christian and a Roman Christian. Now, we don't knock those who say these things and they know no better. But that's what we're here for, to show you what the word of God says. Now, think of this. If your loved one was able to still look at you smile. Because of something that they saw that they were happy about. What would they be doing if they were able to look at you and saw something that upset them? How could they rest in peace if they still knew what was going on in this world? How could they be resting in peace when they saw that their little bitty baby grandchild was just shot and killed by someone in the back seat of the car? They couldn't rest in peace if they had knowledge of what was still going on in the world. So let's look at death as we look at sleep. When you go to sleep at night, me, I like to watch the news right before I go to sleep. So I know <clears throat> that I'm going to sleep around 1030. So from 1030 at night to whenever I wake up in the morning, 430 in the morning or whenever I wake up in the morning, well, I don't know what's happening in this world when I'm asleep. I have no knowledge and conscious of what's going on because I am in an unconscious state called sleep. I don't even know how long I've been asleep until I wake up and I look at my phone or I look at a watch. And I'm, and I'm like, damn, I've been asleep for six hours or I've been asleep for four hours. And how many people woke up, thought you were asleep for eight hours and only sleep for one hour? Or were asleep for, uh, um, um, for one hour and thought you were asleep for eight hours? The dead has no perception of time. Even as you're asleep, you have no perception of time, brothers and sisters. So let's look at this thing. Let's look in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's read Ecclesiastes verses 2. Through six, Ecclesiastes nine, chapter nine, verses two through six. Let's see what God has to say about those who have gone and passed away. If they can still be knowledgeable enough to smile at you. Because of something that they saw that they were happy about. Let's read it. Ecclesiastes nine, verses two through six says, all things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. 
to the good and to the clean and to the unclean. To him that sacrifice and to him that sacrifice not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth and he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all. Yeah. Also the heart of the sons of the men are full of evil and madness is in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Why? And this is the question that we must ask. And this is the understanding of just what I was speaking about of how it is when you are asleep or how it is when you have gone on and passed away or transitioned. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5, always remember this. It says, for the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. The dead know not anything. I'm going to read that again. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Now, that don't mean that we forget them. It just means that whatever was on their mind when they took their last breath is erased. It's no longer there. There is no more conscience. At verse 6, it says, also their love and their hatred. So no matter who you got a beef with, it don't matter who you had an issue with. It says, for their love and their hate, their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So the process from death to eternal life starts with your conscious being erased. Your memory, your love, your hatred, your feelings and your emotions. When you take your last breath, all of that ceases to exist. And this flesh and blood body is just like a seed that is planted into the ground waiting for the harvest. Oh, brothers and sisters, I don't know if you got understanding, but we got to go a little bit further just to tell you a little bit about the matriarch of our family. Carl V. Hawthorne, who original name was Coy. It wasn't Carl, it was Coy. And the V stand for Bernard Hawthorne. He was born September the 22nd, 1927. 1927. He was born in Tennessee to my great, great, great grandparents, Harvey and Lula Hawthorne. He started preaching at in, in, in uh, 1939, he had uh, 84 years in ministry. And again, he was the first person that ever told me that I was going to be a minister and that I was going to preach. Let's go to John, the sixth chapter, brothers and sisters. There's hope in Jesus. Let's go to John, the sixth chapter. There's hope in Jesus. But what we need to know is that process from death to eternal life. How does that work? How does it go? When is the dead resurrected again? Well, let's read John 6, 37 through 44. And let's get some understanding and find out what it says. It says, all that the father gives me. At verse 37, John 6 and 37. All that the father gives me shall come to me. And him that come up to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again, not as soon as they die. But it says, I shall raise it up again at the last day. The last day ain't here yet, brothers and sisters. And some of you may ask, well, when is the last day? The last day is the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because that is the end of this wicked rule and this wicked world and its rulership, brothers and sisters. And that's when he comes to become king of kings and Lord 
of Lords. But let's go ahead in case we didn't have understanding. Continue reading at verse 44. Let's see if it talks about this last day again when the dead will be raised or immediately after you die, as some would say. It says, no man can come to me except the father which have sent me draw him. So if you want to go to Jesus, guess what? You can't even go if you want to go unless the father says, go towards my son and get into the word that he left for us. I'm going to read that again. No man can come to, the, to me except the father, father which sent me draw him and I will raise him up again. At the last day. Well, wait a minute. We just had two places talked about the dead being raised at the last day. Well, let's see what 54 says. He said, whosoever eateth my flesh, that means to consume Jesus's words and drink of my blood. Again, that means to read his word and internalize it. He says, for those who do that have eternal life and I will raise them up. At the last day. And so we keep getting the word telling us that the dead in Christ shall be raised again at the last day, which is the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we have to put this thing in perspective and we have to stop passing down the false information that someone is somewhere looking down on us smiling. And we're going to even deal with that, too. Is that the place that we go when we are resurrected? We're going to even get into that, brothers and sisters. But again, let's continue reading. Let's go to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus came and preached one thing. And then he taught one thing. And those things that he taught and that he preached coincide with one another. He preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the coming of the kingdom of God. So wait a minute. If the kingdom of God is coming, then why have we been told that we're going to go where the kingdom of God is? When where the kingdom of God is, which is in heaven, is coming down here to be with us. Didn't he preach in the Lord's Prayer, that our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That's what he preached, the coming of the kingdom of God. But what did he teach? He taught what we ought to do in order to access it when it comes. Let's go to the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Now, brothers and sisters, there is a whole wisdom behind this forgiveness thing. I'm going to say that again. There is a whole wisdom behind this forgiveness thing. Now, when you read the Lord's Prayer, it ends by saying, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And most people stop at verse 13. They don't read the next two verses because see, the next two verses is too conflicting for some people's spirit. Because when you stand before God, and he questions you and asks you, did you forgive your cousin? Did you forgive that friend who did you wrong? Did you forgive those people who talked about you and assassinated your character? Did you forgive that man who raped you? Did you forgive that woman who cheated on you and had a baby and did you, were you able to process those things and forgive those people? Why is he asking you that? Well, let's read Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 14 and 15. And it says, for if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father Forgive your trespasses. So imagine standing before God. And the only thing that's standing in between you and getting in the kingdom. Is you forgiving somebody while you was here on earth. Could you could you live with that? 
See, forgiving somebody is not for the person whom you are forgiving. Forgiving somebody is for you and your relationship with God. See, brothers and sisters, these are the things that we must concentrate on while we're here on this earth. This is what grants us access to the kingdom of God when it comes. When you are aware of these things, brothers and sisters, you no longer can go through this life the same way that you've been going through this life, holding grudges, still talking about the things that hurt you five, ten years ago. It's consuming you. It's living rent free in your mind. And all you can say is, well, man, you know, I remember. I remember when. I remember this. I remember that. This person did me wrong. And I, you know, how long was that ago? You've been walking around holding this inside of you for all of these years. And you haven't been able to forgive this person, not for them again, but for you and your relationship with God. Because God says, if you forgive men their trespasses, then I will forgive you yours. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, then I won't forgive you of your trespasses. And so we got to learn. We got to get better with that. Tonight's lesson is understanding the process of. From death to eternal life. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. Do we want to be with the Lord forever? Well, these are things that we have to concentrate on. These are things have, that we have to do. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, 13 through 18. And it reads, 4, 13. Let's see. Do I want to read 13 through 18, 4? Let's see. Let me make sure I'm in the book. First Corinthians. Let's see. First Corinthians, the fourth chapter, 13 through 18. Let's do it. And it reads, being defamed, we retreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you, for, for though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent you, Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in uh, Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So what Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, is that we got to put the brothers and sisters in the remembrance of these things that we're teaching today. Often we forget things happen in our lives. We forget. We fall away. Remember they say it was be many falling away from the church. We fall away, brothers and sisters, and we forget. So in everything we do and everywhere we go, we got to keep our brothers and our sisters in remembrance of these things. So no matter what we accomplish in this life, no matter what we achieve, the greatest accomplishment that we can achieve, Achieve is gaining access to the kingdom of God and everlasting life. That's why this lesson today is called Understanding the Process. What we must go through from death to eternal life. But even before death, there are steps and there are things that we must go through. And I always tell people death is not the end. Although when we're at the funeral, we sure act like that this is the end. But death is nothing but an interruption of life. From flesh and blood life to spiritual eternal life. And if you look at it in the example of a train. First stop, you got the birth. Second stop, you got childhood. Third stop, you might have the teenage years. The fourth stop, you might have trouble. The fifth um, stop, you have adulthood. You're grown now. The sixth stop, you got sickness. The seventh stop, you got death. But the eighth stop, brothers and sisters, 
is eternal life. So death is not the last stop in this spiritual train. Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 50 through 55. Let me explain it to you this way. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 50 through 55. And it reads, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Why is it that no matter whether we die or not, right? And it says we all got to be changed from this flesh and blood body to a spiritual body. Because why? Flesh and blood cannot inherit or enter into the kingdom of God. So either way it goes, either you've died before Jesus come or when Jesus come, you are changed. So the dead in Christ raises when Jesus come back. The living in Christ is changed from a flesh and blood body to a spirit beings when, when Jesus comes back. It says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump, this don't happen until the last trump, which is the coming of Jesus. It says, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So has the trumpet been sounded yet? And if the trumpet has not sounded yet, has the dead been raised yet? See, these are things that we have to understand and know that, yeah, the dead is going to be raised. But when it's time, it says that the dead shall be raised incorruptible and shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? See, when flesh and blood is no more, death is no more. Grave is no more. You get the way it's broken down. And that's why that last enemy called death is defeated when we are all changed in a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye. Let's close this thing out in the book of Revelations, the 21st chapter. Now. A few moments ago, I said that Jesus preached one thing and he taught one thing. What he preached was the gospel. The gospel, even according to the Lord's prayer, thy kingdom come, is the coming of the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. What he preached and what he taught were different things. He preached the coming, he preached the gospel, which is the coming of the kingdom of God. And what he taught was what we needed to do in order to access that kingdom when it comes. So I'm going to even take it a little step further. If the kingdom is coming, is the father coming? Now we know that Jesus is coming back because we just read. Jesus is coming. He's descending from heaven. When the last trump sounds. But what about the father? What is the father going to do? Is he going to remain in heaven? Well, if his kingdom is coming down, let's see what he's going to do. Revelations 21. And we're going to read two and three. And it says, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God. Oh, that's that kingdom that Jesus spoke about in the Lord's prayer that he saw coming. He said, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, look, the tabernacle of God, the house of God is with men. Where do men live? On this earth. So the house of God comes down. Is established on this earth where men live, and it says, it says, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he talking about God will dwell with them, and they talking about us shall be his people, and God himself shall be with us. 
shall be with them, talking about us, and be there, talking about us, and be our God. And so, brothers and sisters, when we teach this word the right way, and we get the clear understanding of the process from death to eternal life, we don't mourn like others mourn who are not knowledgeable of the word of God. We know that we will see our loved ones once more. And so, brothers and sisters, I hope tonight's lesson was comforting to some of you who have been dealing with a loss in your family, who have been dealing with loved ones who you have just buried or either cremated. Brothers and sisters, death is just an interruption of life, but it's not the end of life. Let's close out with Numbers, the sixth chapter. Numbers, the sixth chapter. And let's read the comforting word of God. Numbers, the sixth chapter. And we're going to close out with verses 24 through 27. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put the Lord's name upon the children of Israel, and then he will bless them. Thank you so much for your time. For those who are on YouTube and you have a Facebook page, then go and like our Facebook group page, The Truth Hour Bible Class. And for those who are on Facebook, go and like our YouTube channel, Truth Hour TV. Please subscribe to it. We need more subscribers and can and share this lesson. There are those who are suffering and being tormented right now because they don't understand the process from death. The process from death to eternal life, brothers and sisters. So, again, if you would like to be added to our text message. Invite reminder list. Then. Text your name and the keywords Truth Hour to 312-719-7310. Again, if you would like to be added to our text message invite reminder list, then text your name and the keywords Truth Hour to 312-719-7310. Peace and blessings, YouTube.